Well, as we march into the new year, we're going to take just a brief few-week pause from our study of the book of Acts. I promise we'll resume on it fast. But I wanted to take a few weeks to look at a topic that, uh, that I hope can mark our new year. I definitely want it to mark mine. And that is making hard decisions. Now, as you look at yourself or think about where you are in this process, I don't know if you consider yourself an excellent decision maker or a rough decision maker. Maybe you can make decisions quickly, and maybe you have to think through them a lot. It doesn't matter where you are at in the spectrum. I think the, the, the topic is going to apply to you no matter what. Uh, sometimes, whether you're fast or slow, whether you're confident or unsure, sometimes decisions are, are hard to make. So before we talk about things like wisdom and regret, I think it's important for you to know a little bit about the person who's going to be talking about it, specifically the things that I have purchased from infomercials. Before I start talking about wisdom, I mean, I'm going to have to confess this. It'll come out one time or another. I have purchased the the George Foreman grill through the television. This was way before it was in stores. I actually got two for one and gave one as a gift because these were revolutionary at the time that I gave my credit card. I also bought OxyClean. Now, you can get OxyClean in stores now, too, but this is, again, way before that. The weird thing about this is, my wife would be the first one to tell you, I'm not known for being clean. I'm not known for caring about things that are clean, let alone OxyClean. Nonetheless, I bought that thing through the TV. I also bought the Shammies, the Sham sham, uh, Wow is what they're called, right? I call them sham nows because I bought those through the TV, used them one time, and then they were useless after that. They worked the first time. They're sham nows, in my opinion. And then I'll put this one on the screen because I doubt any of you have ever seen this. I bought the Wonder Broom. This this is the last broom, the only broom you'll ever need. (laughs) Because it works on carpet, hard floors. It works on dirt. I mean, it compiles everything, and then you just rinse it out, and it's great for a week, and then those bristles start busting, and then it's useless. At least that's what happened to me, but I had one of those for a week before I had to throw it in the dumpster. So, if I could go back in time to all of the, and I've got more on the list than just that. (laughs) If I could go back in time and tell myself, as I'm on the phone and the woman is asking for my credit card number, I would say, put the phone down. Just step away. Don't do it. You're gonna regret this. The George Foreman Grill is probably the only thing I didn't regret. But that's a funny, or supposed to be, a kind of a comical way of looking at the times in life, the events, the decisions where maybe we have made that we wish we could go back and make a different decision. If we could tell our old self, do something different, we would. Now, it may not have been something like that that only cost us money and a little bit of dignity. Some decisions we've made over the past were much bigger and cost us a lot more. And if we could go back in time and erase that decision, maybe make a different one. I don't know if this is you or not. I know I have chapters of my life, decisions of my life, regret that I would like to not have. I wish I could eliminate those or minimize those. Here's the great news for me. If that's you, then you're going to be able to identify with this. If you make perfect decisions all the time and you have no regret and you don't have any of those chapters in life, you're even for a good nap because none of this is going to apply to you. But if you have those, if you know what that feels like, here's the good news. God has given us a filter from his word to use to all of our decisions, to apply it to all of them, whether they're easy or hard or not, whether the consequences are small or big. There's a filter he's given us to minimize, maybe even completely eliminate chapters of our life where we would go back and change it, to eliminate regret. If you knew there was a way to eliminate regret in life, would you like to know it? I know I would, and I wish that I'd have come upon this much sooner. So before we get to that, I want to show you a a, a very small passage in Ephesians 5. This passage shows us the usual way we make decisions. It reveals to us our tendency. And then it also gives us the filter we could use to minimize, maybe even eliminate regret. It's found in Ephesians 5. I want to show it to you. I'm just going to read it 
verse by verse as we move along. It's found in Ephesians 5, starting in verse 15. Paul tells these Christians, he says, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. And he starts by saying, be careful, meaning be on the lookout is literally what that word means. Be alert. Don't just meander through life hoping everything's going to turn out okay. Be careful. So, many of us, and I, this may not be you, but most of the people I talk to fall in this category. It certainly involves me. Many of us have developed a filter that we use when we have a decision in front of us. Whether it's an invitation, an opportunity, or a fork in the road, and we have to make a decision, we've developed our own filter. And most Christians I know have the same filter. And here's what it is. I wonder if this is the right thing to do. That's usually the question most people ask. Is this the right thing to do? Really, because they're trying to identify if something's wrong or not. So, you have a decision in front of you. Is it, should I go to Texas Tech or Oregon? I wonder what, I wonder what the right thing to do is. Uh, well, the hard thing is there's no Bible verse for that, right? Should I live on this side of town or that side of town? Should I start this new business that I've been thinking about? Which, is it right to do that? Should I sign my kid up for a league that's going to take 10 months out of our life and a few thousand dollars out of our bank account? Should I do that? Well, is it right to do that? Really, is it wrong to do that? And you go, I mean, I'm no expert in the Bible, but I'm pretty sure there's no Bible verse against that. So, yeah, I'll go do this, I'll go do that, I'll sign them up, I'll do whatever. That question of asking what the right thing to do is, is almost never helpful. It's a careless question, but it feels careful, right? Because careless to us is not using any question to filter decisions, just making them. So at least if we ask the question, I wonder if it's the right thing to do. That feels careful, but it's not. It's a careless question posing as a careful one. Because that question is designed to define the line of disaster. Where's the line? Where am I safe and where am I in trouble? So I'll ask the question, is this the right thing to do? Really, is this the wrong thing to do? So I can define the line because if you're like me, you love getting right up to the edge of that line of safety and disaster. And it is an adrenaline rush to stand on this edge and not fall over. In fact, it's an ego boost. Maybe not for you, but for me, the longer I can stand on the edge of disaster and not fall over, I feel pretty strong. I mean, weak people would have fallen over a long time ago. Not me. So I like to ask that question when I'm faced with something to do. What hobby should I invest in? What things should I do with my time? I just ask, is it right or wrong? The nice thing is, when I ask that question, almost never is there an answer to it. So, I just get as close as I can to disaster. And just like to live there. It's like a hobby. It's a really bad hobby. But that's the usual filter. And Paul says, be careful as you, as you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. And then he goes on to say in verse 16, Making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. So I told you something that might be controversial, that asking the question regarding a decision, if it's right or wrong, is not a helpful question. And verse 16 tells us why it's not. It says the days are evil. That's what my Bible says. That means opportunities are not low-danger situations. Opportunities, according to God, are high-danger events, meaning you're not going to get another one around the corner. You're not guaranteed the next opportunity. 
And I feel God piercing me in verse 16. Maybe not you, but definitely me. When I read, make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil, God knows my tendency to flirt with disaster and play games with the decisions of my life. He knows that I like doing this because he knows for me personally, I'm optimistic by nature. And I just trust everything's going to work out. So I don't make the most of every opportunity. I treat opportunities pretty casually because I believe another one will come along. They usually do for people who are hardworking and ethical and smart. So I just trust, oh, it's going to work out fine. And if it doesn't, I'll figure something out. I'm hardworking, I'm ethical, I'm smart. So even if it doesn't work out, I'll, I'll create a new opportunity. I know I am not the only one who's like this. I may be the only one like this in this room, but I know I'm not the only one who thinks like that. And God tells me in verse 16, uh-uh, no, no, the days are evil. You know what? You buy the wonder broom and it breaks on you in a week, ah, you lost a few dollars. But sometimes things get ruined. And we don't talk about this enough in the church. We talk about how God will work all things out to the good to those who love him. We talk about that, and that's true sometimes. But sometimes things get ruined. Sometimes bank accounts get destroyed. Sometimes relationships get decimated. Sometimes jobs end. Sometimes reputations are forever, ever stained. Because not all things work together. God can do that. He just doesn't always do that. Sometimes things stay ruined. Why? Because of a reality we talked about last week. We live in a broken world. And in a broken world, sometimes stuff gets ruined. How do I know that? Because the days are evil. So, make the most of every opportunity. And then verse 17. Don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. What I hear Paul describing as foolish is justifying what I want to do. And that's why I like asking this question, what's the right or wrong thing to do? Because I know there's usually not an answer, and so I can fit what I want into that question. It's why I bought the thing on TV. It's why I took the job. It's why I went on the date. It's why I took the deal. It's why I accepted the invitation. It's why I do all that. Is it right or wrong? Ah, that's fuzzy. So I just live right here. God knows me and how obsessed I am with playing games with my life. My tendency to show how strong I am by flirting with disaster. He knows it. And so he says, don't. Don't be foolish, but understand. I love that phrase. Understand what the Lord's will is. Because understand doesn't mean conceptually get it. It means face up to it. Face up to the fact that God has a different standard than you have. And it's always higher than yours. He always has much bigger dreams for you than you have for you. He believes in your potential way more than you do. Way more. So understand that that's God's will. He's got something in mind for you. He wants to use you in a way on planet Earth that if you thought about it for five seconds, it would blow your circuits. Because God say it's just going to be you and me together, and if we do this together, we are going to change things like no one's ever seen. And you can't even spend five seconds thinking about that because that's too overwhelming to imagine. So you just lower the bar down here, and well, maybe if I do a little good this week, that'll be fine. When I read through the Bible in terms of the phrases, what God's will is, it's huge. The dreams and the plans that he has for his sons and daughters and the difference that they will make in the places that they are will be worth history. Face up to that, Paul says. That reality. So, back to verse 15. Don't live as unwise. Live as wise. Unwise, in my opinion, is asking the question, what's the right thing to do, what's the wrong thing to do? Bad question to filter your decisions. So what's a good one? 
Well, we're going to put it on the screen for you. It's summed up in verse 15 as what's wise, but I want to make it specific so it's actually practical to you today. So here's, how, here's a new filter for you to include with your decisions. Based on, so when you have an opportunity or an invitation or a decision in front of you, here's the new filter. Based on, number one, the experiences that God has provided. Permitted is probably a better word. Based on the experiences that God has permitted. You have a past. All of us do. And God has allowed whatever has occurred in our story, in our past, to occur. So based on your past, number one. Number two, based on the circumstances that God is presenting. Meaning your reality right now. Your relationships now. Your emotional state now. Your physical health now. Your finances now. Based on all that now. And, not or, and number three, based on the dreams that God provides. The burdens you got inside of you that have been there for so long, you don't know when when they started, and you're not even sure where they came from. You just know they're there. It's a burning passion of yours. Based on that, based on your past experiences, your present circumstances, and your future dreams, all of which God has Permitted, presented, and provided. Based on all of that, then ask the question, what's the wise thing to do? What's the wise thing to do? When it comes to signing your kid up for this event or not. When it comes to inviting this couple out for dinner or not. When it comes to, you name it, investing in this opportunity, taking this job, quitting this one, developing this new friendship, putting some boundaries and barriers on another friendship. Whatever the decision is, some of them are hard. But most people I know, starting with me, don't like asking this question. I honestly don't. It's the right one to ask, and I don't like asking it because it eats through the smoke screen of my tendency to justify doing what I want to do in the first place. If I could just ask what's right or wrong, man, I can spin that seven ways from here to Sunday. Young people, how many of you have asked your parents to do something and you've never thought, is it wise to do? You've just wondered, if mom or dad say yes, I got it. And if they say no, bummer. You don't care if it's wise or not, you just wonder if it's allowed. It's the same question as this one. Is something allowed? Is it moral? Is it, is it right? Is it perfect? Is it okay? I should have a table up here so I don't do that again. <laughs> is it permissible? So parents, you now have a new arsenal to give your kids and make them work. So when they come to you and ask, is it okay if I do this? You can respond, well, based on your past experiences, based on your future circumstances, and based on your or your future hopes and dreams in your present circumstances, what's the wise thing to you? Do you think it's wise to even ask me that? Show them ownership. Now, there's an age of kid in there where I don't know where the age is, but if you ask that to some ages, they're going to go, huh? So you're probably not going to want to ask them. But the older they get, I, if they're driving at least, you're safe. Does that question feel threatening to anybody? Asking when you're looking at a decision. For instance, I'll give you three of mine that I've used this filter on. When I started dating Brooke, we went through premarital counseling together. And the reason why is because of my past experiences. I didn't know many Christian couples growing up. Hardly any. And so if I was going to be a godly husband, I honestly didn't even know what that entailed. And when I read the Bible, it seemed like it was written in a different language to me. I didn't really get it. So I needed help. So Brooke and I met with a couple who'd been married for 25 years and been Christians all along, who'd raised four sons, and they sat with us once a week for three months, and we asked them a bazillion questions. I did, especially. 
And that husband, his name was Royce, took me out to eat lunch and asked me a bunch of questions when Brooke wasn't around. Now, I'm not saying I've done marriage very good, but it's a lot better than if I, we wouldn't have met together. And the reason I made that decision to invest my time in premarital counseling was because of my past experiences that God permitted. I didn't grow up in the church. I didn't grow up in, the, in a community that had a lot of Christian couples. Number two, I made a decision. I went through a bad breakup when I was an adult. I dated a girl in college for three and a half years. I was ready to propose, had the ring picked out. And two weeks before that, she dumped me. And she said, we can't be dating anymore because you're really not a spiritual leader. And I wasn't even a Christian, so I didn't even know what spiritual leader even meant. I just knew it was a bummer. I was heartbroken. And that was one of the events, not the only, one of the events in the next three months that God used to bring me to him. So I became a Christian in the next three months. Now, she had already found another guy and was dating him. And Anyway, different story. But as I started going to church and started learning about God and praising God, I found something out I didn't know before. There's a lot of cute girls at church. I didn't know that, but there are. And if you shave and dress okay, and don't put your foot in your mouth all the time, some of them kind of like you. And so I started finding the first year, like I started to get involved in church, like there were a couple girls who didn't think I was gross, which is a miracle for me. If you know my past, that's a miracle. But I wouldn't date them because I knew the circumstances that God was presenting me in the moment my breakup pain was so high, I knew if I started dating right away again, I would just be using this person to fill that void. I wasn't interested in them. I was just still scrambling, to be honest. And I didn't want to use them. As I was learning about God and how you serve others, you don't use them, which was a whole new concept to me. I didn't want to get involved in a relationship but I would just use and consume this person. And if I started dating... Too quick. I know that's what I would have done. So, I dated a girl for three and a half years, and then she dumped me. So I made a rule for me: I'm not dating anyone for three and a half years, and give myself some time to heal. Now, maybe it should have been longer. I don't know, but I actually ended up waiting five years. Not because I wanted to wait five. I would have liked to have jumped in the game a little bit sooner. It was not very easy to find people who could stand my presence. But I found a West Texas girl who's thankfully nearsighted, and anyway, it worked out. (laughs) And then the dreams that God provides. While I was a Christian, I was a successful teacher and a successful basketball coach, and going up, up the ladder. And God put a burden in me to minister to students in a way that dealt with the gospel, and I couldn't shake it. And I wanted to tell them things that I wish I'd have known when I was a kid. So I had this dream to go be a youth pastor, which was a severe pay cut, occupational change. I'm not equipped for this. I could read 90 words a minute, so I'm going to become an expert in a book. Didn't make any sense, but I couldn't shake it. And so, based on that burden, I couldn't shake month after month after month after month. I put everything I had in a 1987 Cutlass Sierra and moved to Dallas, Texas to go to seminary to pursue this dream of being a youth pastor. As if anyone ever dreamt of being a youth pastor. I couldn't think of anything I wanted to do more. It was my dream. That's our three very small but specific examples of how I have used this filter in my life to make the decision of should I move to Dallas or not or stay in my career. Should I start premarital counseling or just get married and figure it out as we go along? Should I say yes to this date opportunity because her friend told her friend, who told her friend, that she kind of thinks I'm not gross? (laughs) Should I pursue that? But before we end, here's what I have to finish on. If you look at that filter, that question, it can help you but it's a conditional help. It won't help you unless something else is true. 
And that's what I want to read to you, the last verse. It's in Ephesians 5. Let me pick up my notes that are scattered all over the place here so it doesn't look so dirty up here. Ephesians 5, verses 18 and 19. Don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Meaning the question we just had on the screen is not a self-help tool. This is a spiritual activity. It's not a mental, it's not an intellectual activity. It's a spiritual one. So the first thing to do is to be wowed, develop an inner gladness for God's grace, which means you got to experience it for yourself. And then... God has given you and me a question that if we applied it to every single decision that we'll make from here on, based on my past experiences, my present circumstances, and my future dreams, all that God has allowed to happen, what's the wise thing to do? I believe with all of my heart we will either minimize or completely eliminate those chapters of regret in life. 